questions. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, everyone, uh, for joining us today. It's uh, a privilege to, to be connected with you all. This is the third of the SIMPEG seminar series. Um, so we've had two previously. Uh, the first one was kicked off by Soggy Kang, and then the second by Thibaut Astic. And you can um, we circulate the, the links on Twitter and, and our newsletter. So if you'd like to catch up on any of those, they've all been recorded. Uh, and today we have the pleasure of having uh, Zhao Long Wei and Zha Zha Sun here uh, from the University of Houston. Uh, so Zhao Long is working on his PhD uh, in the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Houston. He received his master's degree in mineral exploration in 2018 uh, from Northwestern University, Northwest University uh, in China and his uh, BSc in 2015 from the China University of Geosciences. Uh, his research is around uh, the theme of inverse modeling of, of subsurface systems, and he's doing a lot of work in joint inversion and uncertainty analysis. Uh, he's an active contributor in the SIMPEG community, and I think has made some really important progress uh, for the community in bringing in um, joint inversion and broadening who's, who's, being in, who's engaged in the SIMPEG community uh, and really sort of laying a lot of the foundational um, and important groundwork uh, for having multiple methods of joint inversion in SIMPEG. So with that, Zhao Long, I will let you take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for your introduction. So yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Can you guys see my uh, slide? Yes, it looks good. Mm -hmm. Is a point? OK. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Xiao Long Wei, a PhD student in geophysics at the University of Houston. And in the title of the, my presentation today is From Deterministic to the Probabilistic Geoscience Modeling, Analyzing Uncertainty of Geophysic Invariance and Constructing the, and Constructing the, oh, sorry. Maybe I need to remove this video to another screen. Okay. Analyzing the uncertainty of geophysical invariance and constructing the probabilistic subsurface models conditioned on the petrophysical measurements. My co-author is Jia Jia Sun, so I will speak for about the 40 minutes followed by the Q&A sections. And again, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions or the comments. So here are my group members. My advisor is Dr. Jia Jia Sun. This is me. And our PhD student, Xin Yan, she works on the joint invariant. And the divan, she, uh, he works on the machine learning and deep learning. And a graduate student, Kenan, he works on the characterizing the Kimberlite using deep learning algorithm. Here is my agenda. I firstly go through the background research motivations, problems, and objectives followed by the introducing the methodologies used in our work. I will spend most of time on the uncertainty analysis of inversion and the probabilistic geology differentiation. And we end up with the discussions and the conclusions. So let's begin with the introduction. So the multiple geophysical data sets can be well collected from the sky using the L1 platform or on the ground. And the inversion has been a standard and widely used tools to interpret these geophysical data sets, which can help us understand the subsurface features and the structures with various applications. For example, the mineral and the geothermal exploration. However, the uncertainty analysis of the inversion is still underexplored. I'm going to show the two examples. This is the synthetic gravity gradient data we created. After the 3D inversion, we obtained a 3D recovery density model. This is the cross depth slice, and this is a cross section. Because of the non uniqueness, we probably obtained a large sequence of the recovery model characterized by the different features. For example, this model looks smooth with blurry boundaries, and this model is compact. So the question is which one is true in the recovery models? 
And by the way, we performed the invariance using the SIMPAC. The synthetic data model and the code are available in the SIMPAC research. And another example is the Again, this is a GZZ data, and we obtained the density model after the inversion, and we can convert these physical property models to a quasi-geology model that consists of the different geological units shown here. However, we can naturally ask a question that are these small features reliable? If we generalize this question a little bit, that would be how to analyze the uncertainties of the geological units derived from the geophysics. So the objective of our work is to develop the empirical method to analyze the uncertainty of the geophysical inversions and quasi-geology models. In our work, we perform the inversion in the deterministic framework and focus on the 3D inversion. The key idea of the uncertainty analysis is to generate a large sequence of the recovery models with different features. The mixed LP norm regularization method serves our purpose. So next, I'm going to introduce the mixed LP norm inversion. Forney and the Oldenburg 2019 proposed the mixed LP norm inversion strategy. So the objective function consists of the two parts, data misfit terms and the regularization term. So this is the equation for the data misfit terms. And this is the regularization terms consists, that consists of the four different components, smallest component and the three smoothness components. The most distinct features of the mixed LP norm inversion is we can impose the different norm values on the different component. For example, the P and the Q value, we can impose different PQ values shown here. And also these two parameters affect the recovery the model features. Here is an example to help better understand the mixed LP number. So this is the true synthetic model we generated and we simulated the gravity gradient data and, and a degree of the noise. And then we are going to invert this GCZ data. So the first observation is the P and the Q norm values result in the different model characteristics. In this column, the Q values equal to one and the P value equal to two, zero, and one. So we can we observe that the blocking model features with the staircasing effect that is the boundaries of the anomaly body is the parallel or the perpendicular to the axis. And if the Q equal to zero and the P equal to two, one, and zero, we notice the more obvious this piecewise constant features showing here. And in this column, Q equal to two, P equal to two. This is a classic taken of regularized inversion. We obtained the overly smooth model showing here. And another combination of the PQ. So in this column, we can recover some DP information. So in our work, so generally we, wanna, we don't wanna obtain some models looks like this blocky features, unless we have the strong priori information say, or oh, in this research areas, the model looks like the, uh, have these blocky features. So in our work, we are going to fix the Q value equal to two and try to obtain some models looks like smooth and uh, compact like these two. And another observation is another tuning parameter RFS, which is a weight for the smallest components also result in the different model features. From here to here, the RFS from equal to 0 0.5, 1, and the 5. We noticed the more compact model, the larger RFS result in the more compact model showing here, comparing with this model. Similar observation showing here, large RFS corresponds to compact model. And we understood in the 2020, extend the mixed LP norm inversion strategies to the joint inversion framework. So in this framework, we can simultaneously invert the multiple geophysical data sets. And also we can impose the different norm values showing here. And we, we use the cross gradient coupling terms to link the two different physical property models. And this is the example. Again, we observed the, so this is the jointly recovery density and the susceptibility models. Again, we observed that different PQ norm values result in the different model features. Moving on, I'm going to introduce how to implement the mixed LP norm strategies to analyze the uncertainty. 
This is our workflow. The first step is we randomly sample P and R bias multiple times, and then we perform the joint or separate, separate inversions. And we obtained a large sequence of the inverted models characterized by the different model features. And then we can analyze the uncertainties while some basic statistic method like the calculated the standard deviations. So I will follow the workflow introduced in the last slide to analyze the uncertainties of the inversion. This is our field data in the decor areas located in the northeast L1. So this is a observed gravity gradient data. And this black dot indicates the drill hole samples. And this figure shows the rock sample measurements from the drill hole. The light yellow areas is a sedimentary and weathered basement. So we can observe the lower density value shown here. And the gray areas is a pre-Cambrian basement. We noticed the relatively higher density value shown here. So in our work, we will render and sample the tuning parameters P from the 0 to 2 and RFS from the point 0, 0.01 to the 1 multiple times. And each combination of the P and RFS marked as the blue dot showing here. And then we end up with 162 pixel pinom inversions and obtained the 162 inverted density models. However, are all the recovery models good? The answer should be the yes and the no. The yes, because each recovery model can fit our geophysical data well. The no, because only a part of them are consistent with the rock sample measurements. So we have the drill hole data, drill hole located here, and the drill hole pan intersects with the metal gabbro. For the each inverted model, we extract the inverted density value for the metal gabbro and calculate the mean and the standard deviation. The mean density value of the metal gabbro is marked as blue dots shown here, and the standard deviation marked as a whiskers in here. And the, this green area corresponds to the minimum and the maximum density values measured from the rock sample. So in our work, we only accept the models that recover the density values within these green areas. And the marked as the red dots shown here. So we end up with 31 accepted models. This model fit the observed data well and are also consistent with the rock sample measurements. This, this figure displays a combination of the different the P value and RFS. We noticed the P and RFS value for the accepted models primarily grouped in these areas and these areas. So for here, I display a part of the accepted models in our work. They display the diverse features. Uh, for example, this model is a compact. This is a less compact, and this one is a smooth. So here, I only show the 10 models, 10 accepted models, and we have a total of the 32 accepted models in our work. And this, this part of work has already published in the 2021. For the more detail and the description for this model, please find our paper. And here, for the, 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 there are some examples for the rejected models. We have the over 100 rejected models in our work. It generally falls into groups. First is overly smooth rejected models, which had the underestimated physical property values shown here. And another type is the overly compact models. We can say the volumes are shrink with the overestimated physical property values shown here. And then we just compute the standard deviation for all the accepted models. This is the depth slice. This is the two cross section. And we want to use the standard deviation values to approximate the uncertainties. So we observed that the lower uncertainties appear at the boundary of the feature and the high uncertainties at the main geological features. And then we extract the recovery the density value for each model at this tree hole location and the, green, the two dashed green lines indicate that all the 31 inversions agree with each other on the recovery density values showing here. And th therefore, we can observe that the lower standard deviation at the boundary. And another observation is within these two dashed lines, the 31 models are consistent. Say, oh, here is anomaly bodies, even though the magnitude of the density value are different. 
Based on the previous study, the metal gabbro exists in this small region marked as a black box shown here. And then we are going to calculate the mass at the volume for the metal gabbro in these small areas. We can calculate the mass for the, each model cell shown here because we know the inverted density values and we also know the volume of this cell. Then we just sum the mass of the all model cell in this small region. And we can, for the volume estimation, I used a simple threshold values to split the boundaries and the anomaly body. So we, we firstly estimate the volume. The left figure is volume estimates for all the inverted model, a total of the 162. And this figure is volume estimates for only 32 accepted models. So we observed the, the uncertainties represented by the standard deviation. The uncertainties uh, reduces over the 16% after we implement, after we use in the petrophysical cons constraints, which illustrates that the petrophysical data can contribute to the volume estimates and reduce the uncertainty of the volume estimation. And this is the mass estimates. Again, this figure from the, all the models and this figure from only the accepted models. So we notice that the mean value and the standard deviation for the mass estimates are highly consistent, which means the gravity or the gradient data contains the enough information for the mass estimates. And this is a Gaussian's equation. Illustrate that the mass of the anomaly body depends on the gravity data, which are consistent with our results showing here. <clears throat> Moving on, I'm going to talk about the probabilistic geology differentiation. Before talking anything about the probability, I'd like firstly introduce what is geology differentiation. <clears throat> Excuse me. The geology differentiation aims to identify and delineate the geological units based on the multiple physical property models obtained from the geophysical inversion. For example, this is a gravity gradient data. This is a magnetic data. <clears throat> and we can obtain the 3D density models and the 3D susceptibility model showing here. And then we can generate a scattering plot showing here and we identify the different geological unit based on either linear trend or the distinct range of the physical properties. And then we can visualize this 2D scattering plot back to the 3D spatial domain. And we obtain the quasi-geology model showing here. So in our research area, our research area is north of the DACRA area. And this is a GCZ data map. And this is a magnetic data. And this is a 2D geological map generated by the Drench in the 2015. We observed the multiple geological units. For example, this is a mafic intrusion, and this could be a metal gabbro. And this figure represents the rock sample measurements of the density and the susceptibility, susceptibility values from the drill hole samples. I introduced this figure before. Similar to the separate inversion, this petrophysical information uh, will help us determine the accepted and the rejected inverted models. As I mentioned before, the geology differentiation is a process of identifying the different geological units on this 2D scattering plot. We did the geology differentiation based on the jointly recovered density and the susceptibility models. We identified nine different geological units shown here. And then I'm going to specifically explain the reasons behind our classifications. This figure is a scattering plot. This is a quasi 3D quasi geology model. And these two are jointly recovery density and the susceptibility models. The unit one showing here is background. So we just need to select a small range of the susceptibility and the density value shown here. The unit two showing here is dominated by the negative susceptibility values and the relatively zero density. So this unit is spatially located at here. At the boundary of this unit is the showing here and the here. So this unit possibly is a granitic pluton, which are usually characterized by the large magnetic, but the weak gravity anomaly. 
the unit four showing here is associated with the intermediate negative density and relatively zero susceptibility. This unit, geological unit, corresponds to the northeast and southwest trending feature showing here. So we observed this unit excellently matched with the negative anomaly feature in the density models. So we interpret this unit, possibly the silicic pluto, because the prominent physical property models of the silicic pluto is consistent with the unit four showing here. And the unit three showing here is associated with both negative and both negative density and susceptibility values. This unit corresponds to a small isolated body showing here. Hello, uh, can I ask a quick question? Yes. <laughs> I misclicked the clap and I was also clapping, but uh, um, like, did you, you didn't use the positivity constraint for the, like, uh, the magnetic inversion, is that right? Is that the reason why you're having a negative susceptibility value? Yeah, uh, I, I, I didn't use any of the constraint for the joint inversion. I just use really wide values for the constraint, like the positive or negative 100 values. Right. Was there any reason why you didn't put the positivity on susceptibility? So I guess, as far as I know, that's sort of the typical practice, putting a positivity on, because they're probably a possibility, but in general, like uh, susceptibility is positive as far as I know. Yeah, just kind of curious why, why you didn't put the positivity. Yeah, so okay, uh, in our paper, we, we have an explanation for that. You have to have this negative susceptibility in order to, in order to explain your data. In this case, uh, magnetic, data, magnetic data cannot be explained by only positive susceptibilities. So is that meaning it's remnantly magnetized? Yes, possibly, yes. Okay, so this unit, we notice this unit intersect into the both two trendy features. This is a granitic pluto and this is a silicic pluto. So we interpret the unit three probably consists of both granitic and silicic pluto shown here. Xiaolong, there's one more question, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in from Ekong in the chat about uh, slide 36, but I believe it's also this slide here. Uh, the boundaries on the scatter plot, how are those determined? So each of the clusters here use the clustering algorithm or are those sort of interpreted based on um, knowledge of, of physical properties? Oh, we, we didn't use the uh, clustering algorithms. So the boundary for each unit is we iteratively, we iteratively to ad adjust the boundaries of each unit to make sure the spatial distribution for each geological unit is consistent with our uh, recovery the density and the susceptibility models. The typical example is, this is a unit for showing here. So we just uh, adjust, uh, iteratively adjust the boundary of this unit until the boundary, the boundary of this, the spatially distributed boundaries of this unit excellent matches with the negative density anomaly features shown here. And, and, and so that iteration, numbers. is that man, like that's you adjusting that sort of based on your, your visual, um, the, the results you're seeing in the inversion, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Thanks, Xiaolong. You're welcome. And maybe Xiaolong, I can jump in here. So you didn't mention how you exactly did that. You, you begin with some initial guess, right? Uh, yes. And then you have you, you, you use PyVista to yeah to visualize your initial guess, right, in 3D. Yes. And yeah. then you compare, like for example, that's unit one or unit four. And then you compare unit four in 3D with your inverted density susceptibility features, right? To make sure that to make sure that your the 3D visualization, let's say class unit four matches matches the inverted features. If they don't match, then you go back and just adjust the bounds, right? Yes. So this is a uh, manually done. We didn't do any clustering because um, based on my experiences with um, clustering, I don't think it'll work here because uh, for clustering, uh, k-means clustering, fuzzy k-means clustering, it works best when the clusters are compact and has this circular shape.
Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. And the unit five showing here is dominated by the large susceptibility values and the near the zero density values showing here. It appears as a several isolated anomaly bodies here and the here. So we so so we so we think these small features probably be the artifacts because if we look at the boundary of this small feature, it always locates at the bound if we it always locate at the boundaries of some prominent recovery the physical features like this one and this one. So actually, we are not centered about the existence of these small of these small features. So this is why we need to construct the probabilistic models and explore the uncertainties of these uncertainties of the quasi geology models. One exception is that these anomaly bodies. It's a well-defined individual features and correspond to the intermediate susceptibility and relative zero densities. So we believe this unit probably be the true geological features. And for the unit seven showing, unit six showing here, this unit contains the intermediate density and the susceptibility values. So we observe this unit consists of the two parts. First is the Western intrusive features and another is the periphery features surrounding the central anomaly body showing here. So again, we are not sure about the existence for these peripheral features here. So which probably the artifacts caused by the smoothness of the inversion. But for the Western intrusive features, it's probably be a well-defined feature because the outline of this unit matches with the, this positive susceptibility feature as well. And we believe these features could be the mythic intrusion. And the unit seven showing here, this unit contains the intermediate density values and relatively lower susceptibility values. It can be split in the three groups, Western intrusive feature, an isolated anomaly body, and the peripheral, per, peripheral features showing here. So we think the Western, the Western intrusive features is reliable and it could be the mythic, and we are not sure about the existence for these peripheral features here. And also we noticed that this feature corresponds to the lower susceptibility values. We are not center what reason caused the lower susceptibility values. One possibility is the rock string here was hydrothermally altered. Another possibility probably be the metamorphic. And the unit eight showing here, it has a high density and the susceptibility values. We noticed that the unit eight corresponds to the anomaly, corresponds well to the anomaly, to the density, uh, susceptible anomaly features shown here, and also matched with the upper part of the density anomaly. Based on the published work and the large density and the susceptibility values, we interpret this part probably the metal gap. And the unit nine showing here is characterized as a high density and the lower susceptibility values. In the spatial domain, this unit corresponds to the bottom part of the density values. And again, this unit has the lower susceptibility values. We are not sure what caused these low susceptibility features, probably the uh, hydrothermal effects or the metamorphic. So in the previous slides, we are not certain about a few geological units based on based on only one quasi geology model showing here. So this is necessary to construct the probabilistic quasi geology model. So in our work, we random sample the tuning parameters again and then perform the 162, 162 mixed alpinum joint invariance and obtain the 162 pairs of the jointly recovered density and the susceptibility values. And then there are the 37 pairs of the density and the susceptibility models consistent with the rock sample measurements. And we obtained the 37 quasi 3D quasi geology model. And here I display the uh, three types of the accepted models, three of our accepted models. So this is the density model, susceptibility model, scattering plot, and the 3D quasi geology models shown here. And this is another set of example using different p-values and RFS. 
we notice these two models are a little bit smooth comparing with these two models. And this is the scattering plot. This is a quasi geology model. And here, another example. These two models look way compact comparing with these recovered models. And this is the scattering plot. We observed the, the pattern of the scattering plot looks also different. And this is a 3D quasi geology model. So here, just the three examples, we have a total of the 37 quasi geology models with different features. And again, there are two types of the rejected models. This is the overly smooth rejected model with the underestimated physical property values and with the, also with the overly estimated volumes showing here. And this is a, this is a compact rejected models. We cannot see the too much geological feature showing here. And this is a scattering plot and this is a 3D quasi geology models. And then we just uh, construct the probability, probabilistic geology differential models based on a sequence of the quasi geology model we obtained. And we can compute the probability for each geological unit. For example, this is a probability for the unit two. This is the northwest and southeastern trending features. The warm color represents the higher probability. So in this case, we are confident the existence for these trending features in the unit two because it has a high probability. But for this small feature and this small feature, they, they are likely to be the artifacts because they have the lower probability. And for these um, smaller isolated bodies, previously we thought they could be the artifacts, but based on the probability, they are not. They, are, they probably are the true geological features because they have the high probability showing here. And these are the probability distribution for the other geological units. We are confident for this trending feature, this Western intrusive feature, but we are not 100% sure for this feature or this feature or some peripheral feature in the central area shown here. And also we can calculate the um, probability of the less logical type at the, any specific location. For example, in this areas, this areas has the 93% probability to be the unit seven. And these areas have the 69, almost a 17% probability to be the unit nine and the 26% probability to be the unit seven. Similar for this part, it uh, has a 87 probability to be the unit four, which is a silicic pluton. And uh, for the inverted susceptibility models in this location, this is a co this position located at the co features, and it has almost 100% probability to be the metal gap. And similar for here, it has a 94% probability to be the granitic pluton. So, discussion. So in our work, our method actually explores a larger model space compared with a conventional method. For example, this is the equations. This is the equation appears as a straight line shown here. And the dashed red line shown here represents the minimum distance from the original point to this line. And this position is a L2 and the, this minimum distance represents the L2 norm solution marked as a red dot showing here. And this gray dot is randomly sampled models around the L2 norm solution, which is similar to the Monte Carlo sampling method. So we observed that the Monte Carlo sampling method can actually explore the larger model space because the areas of the gray dots, because the gray, these gray dots occupy the more uh, occupied the larger areas comparing with these this red dots. And the, the, these colorful dots represent the solution in the different norm space. For example, this brown dot is a 1.3 L1.3 norm solutions. And this figure display that our method explores a larger model space marked as this red bracket showing here, comparing with the L2 norm solution and the random sampling 
models from, the, from here. And theoretically, in this model space, we can have the infinity solutions. And the conclusions, we have developed a workflow using the SIMPAC to empirically assess the uncertainties and the subsurface models. And the mixed LP norm allows us to generate a large sequence of the recovered models with diverse characteristics. And we assess uncertainties of the physical, recovered physical property values, as well as estimates of the volumes and the mass. We can analyze the uncertainty of the spatial distribution for geological units. We can quantify the uncertainty of the less logical type at any location in the research area. So these uncertainty, these estimation of the uncertainties are really useful and helpful because they can give us the confidence to interpret some geological units with a high probability. And we can also be cautious to interpret another features with a lower probability. And this method that we presented here can be readily applied to different research areas because the series is straightforward and the code is also available in the same pack. And acknowledgement, we would like to thank the Benjamin Grant for the making of core sample measurements available in our work. We, we acknowledge the SIMPAC team for developing the open source package. And we also thank the Pi Vista for visualization. And we thank the University of Houston providing the high performance computational resources. Thanks for your attention. Any questions? Thanks so much, Shalom. This is a really interesting presentation. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but we'll first start and see uh, see who else from the group does. And I see Thibaut's already got a hand raised. And so uh, he, he's the first, first out of the gate. Go ahead, Thibaut. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Shalom. That's a very nice talk. And uh, I've already seen your SEG abstract, and I, re I really liked it. So I have a Many questions, but I will try to limit to, uh, to to just a few, and maybe just the 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 very quick one first on your slide forty five. Okay, the... I believe I have the right number. Is this page? Yeah. So it just uh, so you have like a, uh, like a lot of different models that you get from your joint inversion. So. You are manually adjusting uh, your like your uh, threshold for to be, create your quasi geology model for each one. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Wow, that's a lot of work. <laughs> okay, so that was just to, to to clarify that, or if, if just to like uh, like because it it was clear that you were not using the same definition for each clusters between in, inversion. Uh, so. After that, I want to both uh, discuss uh, like uh, on your slide forty two, mm -hmm. and that the next question also is kind of like relate, uh, related. So like so that's that's so that's so that's so that's, that's for unit nine, and you mentioned that this unit nine also has like less susceptibility at at depths, but at the same time, it's true like. Susceptibility, like magnetic sensitivity, dec uh, decreased faster than the sensitivity of the gravity, and we see that most of the susceptibility features are like closer to the surface compared to your unit nine. So in that case, I'm wondering if the lack of of susceptibility at depths is just not a lack of uh, of sensitivity rather than the body not being magnetic. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Thibaut, this is a graph gradient. OK, so yeah, so, yeah OK. It, it decays the same, right? Yes, yes, right. So that's a good point, uh, Georgia. Thanks. OK, and OK, and so the last thing is more about unit seven. And this one is really more a discussion, like maybe it's like slide 40. Yeah, you know, like yeah, forty. Yeah. So for this one, as you mentioned, like some of the features you get for that unit are not uh, geologically realistic. Let's say, like uh, you have this, uh, like like it surrounds unit unit nine, and from the inversion point of view, it makes sense because I you 
I imagine you started from a uniform HAL space at the background. So, and as we as we iteratively update the geophysical model, like the values in the model have to travel, like go from start from unit one, they, they have to travel through the model space through unit seven and then reach unit nine. So you end up with that like halo around your unit 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 nine and that's that i imagine that's why you get that, that uh, like that circular feature that circular features for unit seven around unit nine and so it just it just to highlight that uh we have some of those like i will just call that an artifact that come from the geophysics but really translate even after that like after that up to your uh uh, probability analysis of the geological unit. Like, uh, I haven't written which slide was that. Maybe, like, when you were showing the probability of each unit later on, maybe like 50 something. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, it's a. Uh... Yes, exactly. Awesome. Thanks. So, yeah, so like, I would say that the probability distribution that you get for unit seven, especially the sick, like maybe not the features on the left, this one, I, this one I can trust, but I will say that the probability uh, that you get for that unit seven that are circulars have actually have as like a, as the interpreter at the end, a very low confidence in that probability distribution at that location. And so like more because like this, this looks like an uncertainty. It's it's a geophysical uncertainty rather than a geological uncertainty. If you understand what I mean, so I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on the subject on like trusting your your the probability you get from those different models? So you mean the this uncertainty is the geophysical uncertainties or the geological uncertainties? Yeah. So just maybe I can just summarize by. Like this, this uh, features, this circular features for unit seven. This probab this circular probability. I will not trust it, and so that's kind of like adding another layer, kind of things like saying like, yeah, like I will trust the probability, the probability we get on the left, but this features in particular, mm -hmm. I don't trust it. Like so, like I have a low confidence in the probability distribution we obtain. Yeah, yeah, I don't trust these features either. I think. Yeah, no, I know, but it's, I'm just like, uh, I, I think actually it's like, okay, what can we do about it? I, and I don't, I, I don't have an answer. Maybe you don't either, but it's my, it's something that's to, to maybe just to think of. Yeah, Tiba, that's a very good point. You mentioned that because, uh, because of smoothness, right? Unit seven, if you compare that the densities with unit nine or the units right adjacent to, to the left, it, it, unit nine, the densities are at the intermediate range. So it's, it might be just, uh, transition zone from zero density to a very high value rate. Right? So that's true. Um, but in unit seven, I think you also mentioned the Western feature is probably true, right? It's a well-defined feature there. And also the one in the South is probably true. So you talk about how to integrate these probabilities. I think, uh, uh, so uh, we're trying to develop some empirical method that people can use in practice. I mean, if you ask me, if the theory here is really mathematically rigorously proved, no, <laughs> we don't have any like, like rigorous theory to quantify the uncertainty. The basic idea is to generate as many um, valid or equivalent models as possible. And then we can do something for practical reasons. And I think the, the unit seven, the probability here still have some use, right? You, um, I don't trust the absolute value, but I would trust more on the relative uh, magnitudes of the probability. If you look at unit seven here, the red represents high confidence, right? And then the less reddish color represents low confidence. I think the I think the relative probability is probably I think in, in unit seven here it's actually actually consistent with our human interpretation, right? The peripheral, the, the circular thing here, it has a lower probability, right? Even though I think if, if you really talk about absolute probability, it's probably not not right. Um, but I think the, again, our purpose is again to work in the deterministic inversion framework, develop some kind of empirical methods that people can use in practice. 
No, thanks. Thanks a lot for those answers. That's uh, it's very, it's just a very, very, yeah, it's a very interesting approach. Yeah, your point is well taken. It's a, uh, it could be smooth, smoothness. Yeah, uh, uh, the smoothness is somewhere in the cross plot. I think some of the features here uh, is the refactoring of that. Speaking of that, um, the Shalom, you mentioned that uh, you're going to fix the Q value to two unless you have like a distinctive reason why like you need to do so. But in, to me, in, in the geology, it seems like actually it's not changing smoothly. Like it's actually changing abruptly. So to me, and like a, I think there's like a no definite reason why like a, you would assume that it's like a, the, the geologic structure is actually smooth. So, and the, the, the the exact problem what Thibault was mentioning is happening due to the smoothness, I guess. So I was just kind of curious, what uh, what's your thought, like uh, why you sort of fixed that Q value to two rather than kind of varying it? Yeah, the, it's in this slide. Yeah, the reason we why we fix the Q equal to two is we just want to award such Stair kissing effects showing here. So the this such stair key, yes. Yeah, yeah, maybe the real geological picture is not smoothly changed, but it currently is but it currently is not the uh, display looks like this such blocky features and have this stair uh, I think you should like uh, use that. There is an option in Dumb's LP code, like uh, using a total. <laughs> total gradient rather than uh, like a component. I yeah. think actually that really effectively solves that problem. Like rather than having a staircase, like a blocky-ish model, you can actually like uh, generate the smooth, but still a rapid, like uh, abrupt transition between one unit to the other. I, I, that, that was my experience. I was just curious what uh, Yeah, Yeah, you're right. There is a total variation uh, in the LP norm inversions. And we also did a explore for this method. So we noticed that in the total variation, when we even we use a sparse norms, we can still obtain some smooth models. But that smooth models is just uh, one of the these models we generated. So that means that it just the even we use the total variation with the sparse norms, the generated models are still within the range of we generated the models shown here. And the slide 22 was quite intriguing, like a, this like a L-shaped feature in your cross plot uh, of, uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Can you, like a, what's your, like a, what's your reasoning? Why we're having such an interesting structure in the cross plot of uh, alpha S versus P? Yeah, I don't know why the, accepted the combination of the P and R as display such interesting features. Mm. Yeah, this is just a I of a 10. Maybe I can. Uh, so I long, we, we can explain that, so long. Uh, let me try to explain this. Um, so if you look at this, uh, maybe P value around zero, right? It's just like a vertical stack of red dots. To the right, P uh, becomes increasingly closer to two, right? So we are getting closer to L2 now. Right. When you think about the inverted values, the inverted value becomes smaller, 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 right? So in other words, all the blue dots to the right of this vertical stack of red dots, their inverted values are lower than the lower bound of the physical property measurements. So we cannot use that. Similarly, to the right of this vertical stack of red, red dots, all the blue dots on the left-hand side, the PNOM, they become so, um, smaller, 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 eventually becomes zero. Again, if you think about the physical properties, the inverted physical properties will become larger and larger and larger right? because P is decreasing, right? So all the blue dots here, they represent inversions whose inverted values are larger than the lar upper bound of the physical product members. We cannot use that. Now, the exception is here uh, at the very bottom here for the very small RFS value. I think Jordan showed that when RFS value is really small, um, even P is, is very small, you can still recover um, smooth features 
Um, yeah, so this is determined by petrophysics, um, petrophysical measurement. Now back to your earlier question, uh, even if we fix Q equal two, we can still recover very blocky model. So can I go back to the previous one where you show the slash six, maybe? Yep. Um, uh, no, uh, go, I don't know, move on to where you show the different inverted model from different P, Q, and FS. Yeah, this one here. Uh, so okay, you might want to take a look at the lower right corner there, lower right corner inverted model, Q equal to two. Yeah, you can we're... still have a very blocky model with Q equal to two, right? Yeah. So we are not we are not excluding that from our uncertainty analysis. Well, you might have saturated your colors there, right? We're not seeing the full uh, the full spectrum there. I think that's going to be the main difference with Q with a small Q is that your values are going to be more consistent without necessarily spiking spiking up, right? So uh, my feeling is that you're probably saturating your two point five, and we're not yeah, seeing the right. full yeah. the full range. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And uh, about your um, suggestion for using the um, astrotropic total variation, we, we tried that. Dom, Dom actually brought that, suggested that, uh, suggest that we did that. But remember, um, yes, the astrotropic total variation can recover very compact blocky curve features. But remember here, our focus is to do uncertainty analysis, right? We want to generate many, many models, not just one, right? With, if we use astrotropic total variation, we, we, we can only generate one mode, right? Um, there's no parameter for you to adjust for isotropic total variation, right? And our purpose here is to do uncertain analysis. We, we want to generate 100 models, not just one. So that's why we didn't use that. We have to try that after Dom suggested that one, but didn't work for our purpose. Oh, uh, Dom, am I wrong? Like, a, even like a, if you are actually varying P or Q values, even if you use the total variation, you're still getting a different result, I guess. That's what I think uh, I'm wrong. I'm not sure what you're saying about the uh, the anisotropy. I don't think we're we're asking to yeah. to yeah. to push one AX or Y or Z. It's just that if you do total variations, then you're gonna get spheres rather than boxes, right? right. And that's another suite of models. Right. right. Yeah. So Jaja, I guess like I'm not sure your comment about anisotropy is like necessarily. The isotropic total variation simply is a sum. Sorry, the, the, the norm of the uh, of the um, just the gradient of the. Yeah. Okay. So what you mean? Yeah. 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 It's TV. Yeah. Yes, that's uh, isotropic. That's called isotropic total variation in, in literature. And uh, uh, anisotropic total variation is simply a one norm. Right. You apply a one norm to different components. That's called isotropic. Uh, anisotropic total variation. Uh, in this for the isotropic total variation uh, or the gradient or the magnitude of the of the gradient, there's no tuning parameter there, right? I don't think there is a tuning parameter that allow us to 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 manipulate uh, to generate a sequence of models. Yeah, it's Q. It's just Q. Then you are moving away from the total variation, isotropic total variation, right? Well, it's just a, it's basically, it's basically like a model norm, but it's on the gradient. Yeah, so, so long, can... um, we did exactly that. We actually, uh, we actually um, change Q, uh, Q. So long, if you rem if you remember, mm -hmm. some of the models really looks really really odd, and <laughs> we, we we include that in, in our um, response to you as a reviewer. I don't know if you still remember. No, I, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's uh, that. That would probably uh, maybe help for the um, for the um, the uncertainty analysis, right? Because then you would add, you would get ranges of values, uh, like you know, it would increase the uncertainty in, in places that you're not that you're less you're less sure. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Can I ask a question? Uh, are are you guys done? Yeah. It looks like we we do have a question uh, from okay. Oleg. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Like, we'll, yeah. we'll come back to you, Dom, if that's okay. Thanks, John. Uh, Oleg, please, please go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Jalong, great presentation. Thank I you. don't have a question, just a comment. Your geology differentiated slide 
um, with negative susceptibilities. There was a comment from Soji regarding the negative susceptibilities and how you could address this. I just wanted to comment uh, and say that I see this as an opportunity in terms of you could resolve this issue by combining the results of the susceptibility and NVI modeling as separate geochron layers as an add-on to your quasi-geology interpretation because remnants would imply a different geochron. Even if it's the same geological units, sometimes it, it won't, but often it will. And let's say reactivate the igneous body that went through a different intrusion phase. It could represent an, an additional layer of information. So, so you mean that I probably... I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, I... I, I, uh, so, so well, like, can... if I understand correctly, you're suggesting add another layer of information, right? And that layer of information is related to time. You said to your Quran, right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, uh, that would definitely help. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great presentation. I'll follow Sorry, up with I you. I've never done that before, but I will, we'll follow up with you on that idea. Yeah. That's a have great a great day, everyone. Thanks, Ali. Thank you. John, please, please go ahead. So I guess the, the, the hard labor part of this, <laughs> it's the, the segmentation that you're doing in the, in the scatter plot, right? Uh, that's a lot of work <laughs> yeah. and it's, it's manual work. Uh, what's, the, what's the way forward? What do you see, uh, what do you see is, you know, because people are not going to do this, right? We're like practitioner geophysicists, they're not going to segment scatter plots manually. <laughs> I guess the, the the neat part is that if you had petrophysics, then you could uh, you could use like actual physical properties to to segment it. But yeah, I don't know. What's your thought? What's next? Maybe I can jump in here. Um, uh, if, uh, before talking about uh, way, for, uh, way ahead, uh, let me talk about two challenges here, right? Uh, first challenge is that in this case, in this area, we don't have much real data. We only have that one single real hood, right? So we don't have uh, like um, prior physical problem management that allow us to do any supervised training because for supervised machine learning, you, you need to have a training, a lot of training that we don't have that in this case. So that's, that's supervised machine learning. Uh, could be applied if you have boreholes that, that have a lot of uh, physical property measurements, then that will give you a very, really good understanding of the physical property uh, ranges for, for the, each rock type. But in this case, we don't, ha don't have that, uh, that information. If you have, then you could try maybe supervised machine learning. Now here for the unsupervised machine learning, again, I don't think it will work. You just apply k-means here. It doesn't it would not work because k-means is only good at uh, detecting circular features, circular clusters. Now, another big challenge here is I remember um, for geophysical inversions, the, if you use autonomy inversion, the inverted values will be systematically lower than the true values. Right? If you go with L0 norm, you'll probably go, with, go to the other extreme. Right? All the inverted value will be systematically larger than the, than the petrophysical measurements. So how to tie these geophysically inverted values with petrophysical measurements? That's another big challenge. About way forward, um, maybe machine learning, if you have uh, enough drill hole data. But again, even if you have uh, enough drill hole data, you still need to deal with this systematic uh, bias thing, right? And um, and secondly, at this point, um, for practical applications, my, my view is that the, any, the automatic method has not matured to such extent that people can use that in practice. So in practice, the way I see this do, the way Xiaolong did it, just um, human experts examine the distribution of the, cross, the, the values in the cross plot uh, begin with some initial guess, visualize in 3D, compare that unit with the inverted feature to see if match. If matches, you're good to not go back and adjust, adjust your classification. 
Uh, I know that's not a good answer, but I don't see a really good, smart way here. Repeat again, Xiaolong, how you were picking the, the threshold. So you look at your 3D model and then what? What do you, what do you, how do you adjust your bound on the unit? So I, I just uh, visualize the model in the 3D spatial domain and to make the identified units in the consistent with the a part of the recovery the physical property model. For example, for this, I mean, yeah. Special I value, I see, I see, okay, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I guess if you had a geological map, you could maybe use the geological map to figure out uh, where the bounds, you know, where those boundaries occur. And then, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> it's cool though. I like, really like what you did. You're ready for your, th for your thesis defense. <laughs> you have a lot of stuff. Thank you. Working more, just graduate. <laughs> Don't do like us. <laughs> Thanks, Dom. I see Craig's got a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Sorry, I missed the first few minutes of your presentation, but I'll go back and look later. Um, I just, just got a question around this cross plot again. I'm wondering why uh, there's not kind of an obvious boundary at the zero, zero kind of uh, cross of positive susceptibilities or positive density contrast, negative density contrast. Uh, did you, those seem like kind of logical boundaries from a physical point of view. I just wondered, did you try, try with that kind of zero, zero as a, as a fundamental um, delimiter in your manual? Because it seems if you've got some unit that has, say unit one has both a positive density contrast and a negative density contrast all in the same unit. That's a bit tricky to understand geologically. So you mean for some unit, I have the both positive and the negative contrast values? Yeah, yeah. Because, so I think it's because the, in the inverdance, the, the the tradition of the each geological unit is not the, it, it has a smooth tradition for the different geological units. So for example, the positive anomaly body and we have a contact with a negative anomaly body. So the transition of these two unit bodies should go from the positive to the negative, smoothly go from the negative to the positive. So if we do the classification, we need to, um, the, 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 uh, we need to determine the boundary be between the, the positive and the negative values. Right. So why, but why, so then why wouldn't you split that along kind of the zero line in this plot? If, 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 the, if it's, the, if it's the, the, the halfway point, if you like, between the positive and the negative. Oh, you mean this one? Yeah. Like why, like why for unit one, would mm -hmm. you have quite a lot? It's nearly half of your unit is a negative density contrast and the other half of the same unit is a positive density contrast. Because the unit one is a background. So for the background, I just... Oh, I see. Right, right, right. Yep. That makes sense for that one. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Good stuff. You're welcome. Thank you. I'll go back and look at the first 10 minutes later on to, to get the mechanics of it. <laughs> thanks, Craig. Uh, Jake, I see you've got a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Shalong. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the, the drill hole data. Um, so you, you used it as acceptance criteria, essentially for the, for the model ensemble. Yes. Um, did you also... Think, think of using it as a constraint on the inversion, like as, as part of the, the, the loss function for the inversion um, and, you know, or, or, or not. And I guess what, what went into to designing that or what, it, what went into your, your decision there? So you question the why, why, so why I didn't use uh, this pathophysical data as a constraint during the inversion? Is that your yeah. question? Mm -hmm. Because the first reason that it does the pathophysical data is the just as a one sixteen feet, it's pretty shallow. But in our model, it had, uh, our model it had uh, 
say over maybe next to eight thousand meters. So for so if we use this petrophysical data as a constraint that can just control really shallow part of our inverted model, it doesn't affect uh, the deeper part. Got it. Um, but but if you had so, so say for example if you had more uh, data, um, do, would that be a valid approach then to to just constrain your ensemble essentially to, to like respect the drilling drill hole data you do have? Um, do you think that'd be helpful? Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, if we have more drill hole data. From it not only it on it not only help us in the environment, but but also could help us into the geology differentiation. I think. Yeah, that's definitely true. Probability yeah. of you know the geological probability decreases around the hole. You know, if let's say you just you just fix the values on the hole with the physical props, and then you invert you you do your one hundred and sixty two inversions right mm -hmm. with that reference, and then see. How how does that influence like away from the from the well, right? Are you getting like different different uh, different uh, good model coming out? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't quite follow your question. You mean the geology differentiation or the just the uncertainty analysis for the um, separating bird? Yeah, yeah, both. Yeah, if you're adding the uh, that constraint, I'm just following up on the on Jake's Jake's comment. Mm -hmm. If you put one well in, how does your uncertainty analysis change as away from that well? Does it does it help you? It must, but uh, it would be interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Tom, well done, uh, Shalon. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Shalon. Uh, one last ask for any other any other questions. I don't see any more hands, but we'll give give a moment in case there's anybody else. Oh, just real quick, the, the first part of the work already published in geophysics. Uh, we, we can send you the paper if anyone is interested. And the second part of the, the probabilistic geolo geology differentiation in Xiaolong will also be presenting that SEG um, the pre recordings. Um, but if you're interested, we can also send you the recording, uh, the recorded presentation for the SEG part, which is a like, more expanded part of version of the second part. Yeah, I'd be interested in a copy of the geophysics paper if that's possible, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I think probably everybody would uh, judge it. So maybe just sort of make it available. And Shalom, oh, yeah, yeah, that, was, that was a very nice presentation. I, re I really like that whole concept of uh, you know, having, you know, having a drill hole and using the petrophysical model on that and just see if at least at uh, one location, you can get a suite of LP and LQ parameters that um, you know, are representative of that. So at least you're getting perhaps the right kind of model at one location on in your domain. And uh, that's a start. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Odenberg. Perfect. Well, thanks so thanks so much, everyone, and a big thanks to Jalong and Jaja. I think this prompted some great discussion and ideas, um, and so very much appreciate your presentation. And we'll be in touch about uh, next month uh, very soon. So thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon or morning or day wherever you are. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you guys. Thanks, guys.